Hi, it's the beginning of June, and we're back tonight for our fourth vet event. We're part of the Roaring Fork Valley Horse Council, and we'd like to welcome you. Dr. Chuck Maker from the Alpine Animal Hospital is going to be our expert tonight. He has a PowerPoint that I think you're going to all enjoy. And you find them on the RFV horsecouncil.org website. And pretty soon we're going to put them up um, as videos as well. And so uh, join us. Use the chat box tonight. Everything is going to go as planned, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, a nice event. Thank you very much for joining us. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Charlie and Brenda and Karen, for being here tonight. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, some things uh, that are, I think, kind of the rudimentary knowledge or what I hope to be for trail riders and, you know, people from the putting the horse in the trailer to getting the horse back to the trailer, some basic first aid things I think that, you know, if you understand, it can empower you to take better care of your horse. Uh, let's see how I advance my slide here. My computer, there we go. Okay, so um, if you use the chat session question box and Karen is the techno wizard she is, uh, we can keep this lively or if you want to just unmute yourself and show us your face, we can answer questions as they come up because this is not meant to be a monologue. It's meant to be a, a lively discussion about individual circumstances and things. Um, again, the idea here is not for you to necessarily, you might need to call your vet or might need to call me for a first aid emergency, but I think through empowerment and education, we you know, we can do so much better for the animals that we love so much. And I think one of the things I put in here since last given this conversation, I think is to kind of either support or better explain, or in some instances refute uh, what's out there on Dr. Google. Um, Cause it happens every week we get, uh, well, this is what I've done so far. And, you know, sometimes free advice is worth exactly what you paid for it. Um, we sometimes have to backtrack and catch up with what has been advised on an online platform. Uh, so, you know, the basics of first aid, I was a Boy Scout, uh, be prepared, um, anticipate the worst and uh, hope for the best, uh, design a first aid kit and be able to use it. Um, panic is never good. Uh, while, you know, the seven P's of performance uh, all start with P, panic is not one of them. Uh, prior proper planning prevents poor performance, panic's not in that. So um, knowing when to call for help, that's part of what we're gonna talk about tonight is what things can you manage yourself and what things can we kind of think you can manage on your own. So, you know, that Karen and the Roaring Fork Horse Council have uh, been so kind as to put on these discussions and, you know, we're kind of going into the thousand piece puzzle that I call the horse herd health puzzle. Um, every time we uh, discuss an issue, we'll add another piece to the puzzle. And tonight's conversation is going to be on first aid with, by request, a few comments on vaccinations because it's timely for this time of year. So, you know, knowing what's abnormal starts with knowing what's normal, right? And we print up a bunch of these laminated cards to give to people because, you know, things, if you laminate them, you know, people tend to acquire stuff over the long longevity of their horse and they're in the tack room, in the tack box, in the, in the trailer, you know, tack bucket, uh, you know, I forget what a normal heart rate is supposed to be. So having these things written down somewhere until they're indelibly ingrained in your head is a good idea. Knowing what's abnormal uh, only comes after knowing what's normal. So just on the way home tonight, I had a question, horse got a snotty nose, uh, his temperature is 102.5, that's normal, right? No, not the case. Uh, you know, you know, got a horse out of the trailer, off on a trail ride, uh, and the horse is coughing. And should I take the horse on the ride or not? No. Um, interestingly, this will tie into the vaccine discussions here at the end because had they gone out on the horse and your horse been nose to nose, uh, we should talk about vaccines because that horse would spread this respiratory disease all up and down the trail. It's just kind of funny how the world works. Um, pink and moist mucous membranes. 
uh, knowing how to recognize gastrointestinal sounds for a colic uh, with a rudimentary stethoscope. Um, you know, and capture the refill time, you know, knowing how to blanch their mucous membranes to kind of get a better approximation of their, uh, of their hydration status. So, uh, you know, this is all simple and it's all going to be on the website and it's all available via PDF. So if people want this, they're happy, I'm, you know, plagiarize and cut and paste and copy away. But veterinary phone, in your phone, cell phone, GPS, you know, flashlight, all these things, um, you know, everyone seems to acquire a first aid kit differently. Some people just purchase a complete one that we sell and other people, you know, I've got 15 years worth of stuff in there. And, you know, to that end, that stuff might expire. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that we had a 15 year old uh, jar of butte get offered as, well, can I give him this for that swelling? You know, and it expired when Bill Clinton was president. So sometimes those things aren't you know, they do have a shelf life. Um, uh, antibiotic eye ointments, I always comment that common things occur commonly. So be prepared for the common emergencies before you decide to become prepared for the inane, you know, one off in a one in a thousand uh, type emergency. Um, you know, so be, be cognizant of what happens commonly. Um, I will say that in the first aid kits that we provide, they have medications in them and that always medications need not be in the hands of children. Um, and there's a few basic things that now with Amazon and Jeff Bezos, you know, you can get bandage scissors and bandage knives and stethoscopes um, readily to your door tomorrow. Um, we've printed up and have on our website a few first aid newsletters that you're happy to cut and paste and use as sources of information with what you get from your veterinarian. So again, just kind of listing them here so when people take this PDF, they can go, okay, checklist. Um, no first aid kit is complete without a roll of duct tape. Uh, now I use Gorilla Tape. Uh, if you can't fix it with duct tape, uh, you know, it's, you need to call the vet. Um, and a, bother, a bunch of other things that you may or may not right off the bat be comfortable using like a hoof knife um, and some rudimentary farrier equipment but you know, the longer you're involved with horses, realizing that you know, lamenesses occur commonly in the foot, uh, the longer or the more acutely aware you'll become of, I need to have some ability to be able to manage some sort of foot injury um, and some bandage materials there. Um, again, just uh, the ones we put together, we commonly will give small volumes of anti-inflammatory medications like banamine or butte, uh, typically used for colics or orthopedic lameness emergencies, uh, so that you have them, you know, on the saddle horn in your bag, uh, so that you know when they're high lined and you're camping at Capitol Trail somewhere uh, and they're lame tomorrow, you can actually give them some relief, uh, get them out to the trailhead. Um, all sorts of different things. I mentioned again the expiration dates, and you know some of these things, you know, we just don't willy nilly give out. And I think your veterinarian would share that belief, that that common thought there, because you know things given to in the wrong circumstances can do more harm than good. Um, banamine or butte paste given to a horse that's tying up that's dehydrated can be deleterious and further complicate their kidney issues. So, just uh, through knowledge uh, comes empowerment, right? So. Uh, be thorough with your uh, understanding of first aid uh, because your horse will benefit from it. Uh, again, just moving down the list uh, meant to be as a just a shopping list for you on Google or Amazon. Um, I think having some familiarity with some of the vaccines we'll talk about at the end, uh, particularly with tetanus and typically with wounds and, you know, wounds happen, you know, your horse gets into a bog that gets off the trail um, making sure they're uh, vaccinated uh, for tetanus and rabies. Um, you have rabies in Michigan, I know, but we had now found out we also have rabies here in Colorado last January in, in the local area, so in horses. So uh, things to think about ahead of time. Um, I just, you know, out of these things here, moving down the list, one thing that I think bears, you know, again, I go back to the eye injuries um, 
people are, you know, I don't know what percentage of people wear contacts or, you know, but saline eyewash that's useful for people that wear contacts um, is also very good for horses. It comes in a container that lasts forever, quote unquote, forever, and can be used to rinse out uh, eyes and foreign material from eyes as that's a common occurrence out on the trail and when trailered for that matter. Um, horses have trailer accidents all the time and get lacerations to the top of their head and uh, eye trauma. Um, horses' eyes are very prominently attached you know, on the sides of their face. And as such, uh, big, beautiful animals, as powerful as they are, they easily traumatize their eyes. So that saline eye wash, in my mind, is something that you should have never leave home without it. Good for cleaning out wounds as well. It even comes in a squirter bottle. Um, and then, you know, we'd like to think our hands are clean, but oftentimes they're not. And we can put more in a wound than's already there. Uh, so just some simple exam gloves. Now with COVID, we're probably used to buying masks and gloves and hand sanitizer and all that, all the like. So some of this has gotten easier as uh, those types of things are more commonly probably possessed by most people. So I, I picture here, you know, this is what's in my little quarter of my saddle bag. If I go out on the trail, um, you know, you're not going to fix the wound that occurs, but at least you're going to be able to cover it and keep it from getting worse or infected or, you know, contaminated. So you get back to the, get back to an office or a trailhead when your vet meets you. I throw the, the picture there. Um, bandaging can actually cause, you know, a ba an improper bandage can cause more harm than good. You know, we've had them uh, just a thousand yards from where I'm sitting right now last summer a simple puncture wound over the cannon bone uh, and too tight a bandage placed overnight gave the horse a bandage bow by the owners when we saw it the next morning that we dealt with for weeks in the summer and the horse missed local shows up on Missouri Heights. So be cognizant and be knowledgeable and be thoroughly uh, um, you know, proactive in the way you apply those leg bandages to your horse. So I will go into individual body systems. I break this down and again, invite questions as you have them. But, you know, here's two eyes, you know, one doesn't look too bad uh, and one's obvious, right? You know, the lower case is this horse has obviously got a painful eye, wound up having a foreign body underneath the lower eyelid, you know, and again, a situation where knowing what to put in the eye, how to put it in the eye, uh, and timeline of when to put things in the eye is very important. Um, but, you know, signs of eye problems may be very subtle on the top picture, just a little swelling on the lower eyelid with potentially a little bit of droopiness or aversion to you handling the horse on that side of its face to the obvious lower uh, mule that's just, you know, you can't get near it. Um, and the eye, when you do open it, uh, looks very abnormal. So, I mean, all those things, whether it's conjunctivitis from flies that's caused or led to a, a scratched cornea or a foreign body, all those things can look similar and have quite a, a spectrum or a range of severity. So knowing, you know, what to do, uh, again, it, you know, if there's something obviously sitting in the horse's eye, we've even had it be hair uh, from them rubbing on their uh, knee, uh, you know, a hair a foreign body and horses have such strong blink muscles that they can scratch their eye inadvertently, just like you and I, you know, the doctor says, don't rub your eye from allergies. Well, yeah. Okay. Easier said than done. I'm very sympathetic. Uh, rinsing the eye with that, uh, you know, disposable, you know, single use, you know, 500 mil or one liter size saline. Uh, we commonly give it in a bag because it's easier to store and you can cut a teeny tiny corner off the bag and make like a high, a water pick and either rinse the eye or rinse the wound. So, you know, usually first aid space is pretty limited. How much space do you have in that kit? Uh, and you're, you know, you're carrying other things too. So having one thing uh, provide multiple purposes is kind of a, the, the pragmatic approach, the logical approach I try and empower people with. Uh, triple antibiotic ointment, you know, not every triple antibiotic ointment is the same. Uh, there are definitely those meant for the eye, which if you work with your veterinarian, I think will, will give you a tube of that ointment. Um, but in a pinch, 
the brand name Neosporin eye ointment, uh, brand name Neosporin can be applied to the eye without uh, detriment. It's not quite the same formulation as ophthalmic ointments, but if you're shopping and you're in Valentine, Nebraska, and your horse has an eye problem and the nearest vet's 200 miles away, um, having a tube of Neosporin in the first aid kit for you and for the horse, if you haven't got the time to get one for your horse's eye, uh, will, will help avoid uh, or at least keep infection in control until you get secondary care by your veterinarian. Hey, Chuck. Yeah. Um, I wrote you a question in the chat room. Did you see that? Oh, you know me. It's uh, where, where is the chat room? Oh, there's the chat. There it is. Is the eye the most damaged area in the horse on trails? Um, I, you know, I don't think so. I think we see more lacerations from the fetlock down. I mean, bogs, stream crossings, wire, downfall, deadfall, you know, I think we still see more lacerations, but um, I, you know, I can remember one good case up in Basalt Mountain last year that a horse really got hurt on the eye trying to get it under a tree. Uh, behind the horse in front of it and the branch swung back and hit it in the eye and you know the stick was still in the eye when when it came into the clinic so um, thanks for the question I, now that I know about the chat I'll be all over it um, one thing to comment is a lot of times people have ointments of various kinds uh, eye injuries and until proven otherwise should be assumed to contain some sort of corneal scratch you know a damaged cornea and in so much uh, to that extent, you know, you do not want to put steroids in the eye. So many ointments have steroids, anti-inflammatory steroids in them. They actually suppress the immune system and the swelling response. Well, they also suppress the inflammatory response against infection. So if it's not, if you haven't been told it can be put in the eye of a scratched horse, then you shouldn't put it in the eye. Just a, a word there, that's, that's like one of the 10 commandments. Um, get back here to how do I advance the screen? Oh, there we go. So here's two eyes. Here's the obvious one, uh, banged itself coming out of the trailer. Um, you know, okay, it's got a cut here, but what you don't understand is this green dye that we put in the eye shows that that cut went straight across the cornea, you know, and the horse now you can't open its eyes. So, you know, that's probably an obvious one, but sometimes obvious isn't obvious to everyone. And this is one that started like this without the laceration, but with a teeny tiny little puncture to the cornea. And, you know, I thought the horse was fine. Uh, we were in Utah and now, you know, five days later, we've got a, a eye full of pus. This is a emergency to help this horse not lose its eyesight. Um, you know, I, those pictures, I think pictures are great, right? You know, it's like, now that I have an iPhone, I have a picture of every emergency I've ever seen. And, you know, the blinking, the tearing, all these pictures, I hope, stay with you uh, to where you're like, oh, that looks like an emergency. It's squinting or it's tearing or, you know, keeping its eyes closed or he shies away from me. Um, we often give banamine in our first aid kits because banamine is a profound pain reliever. And many times horses with pain will actually make the problem worse because they try and scratch their eye more. So, you know, Whereas sometimes we want a horse to be, how shall I say, respectful of its injury. If it's an orthopedic injury, let's say a laminitis, in, a, in an eye situation, we profoundly want to just kill that pain as soon as possible. So, you know, banamine has no downside here uh, prior to you getting secondary care. Um, you know, a couple other subtleties, going back to the picture I just showed you, any sort of abnormal hue, whether it's yellow or blue to the inside of the eye, uh, is a sign of inflammation or infection in the eye and is, a, is an immediate veterinary emergency. I mentioned these here. This is characterizing this blue character here. These are blood vessels that are, this injury has been going on for about 10 days because these blood vessels can be dated. And here's one after we've, you know, had that laceration in that horse that had the corner of the eye. Here's the, the, the piece of cornea that it removed you know, after it hit the side of the trailer. So these things oftentimes can have, you know, uh, easy things to identify and maybe more difficult things because horses blink so strongly and you can't see in their eye. 
Okay, so before we get to lacerations, a, a, a couple words about colic because colic is usually like, you know, the four letter word puts the fear of death in everybody because you're, you know, it can be everything from a spasmodic gas colic to like yesterday, Memorial Day, all day uh, surgical colics. Um, and they don't always happen at the opportune times, i.e. yesterday, uh, trail rides on Basalt Mountain. You know, little cramping, kind of not wanting to move forward. Gosh, every time we stopped, she wanted to kind of cramp behind. Um, you know, we see it. And I, I throw, I've seen horses that just, you know, are starting to have these mild symptoms listed here. Um, be surgical colics, and I've had horses with just gas colics that are going to be medically managed over here in the severe category. You know, there there is cross pollination between those uh, symptom lists. So even though your horse is just lip curling or maybe yawning and pawing a little bit, um, you know, if you're walking them and they're not getting better in some short order, um, hopefully you're able to call a vet. Uh, you know, I think colic is just it's one of those things that takes still too many horses um, and uh, earlier intervention is is superior. Um, again, though, Banamine, I would rather keep a painful horse medicated and keep you keep them walking than keep them unmedicated so I can see them and let them try and roll and make a medical colic, gas colic into a displacement or a surgery. Um, so Banamine is usually something we empower people to, to make sure they have so they can give to people. You know, and uh, again, just a few comments. You know, water's always good. Give them oral electrolytes. Sometimes they're electrolyte depleted if it's been hot and they're dehydrated. Uh, increases their water intake. But you know, it's like if the if the sink is is plugged, if the drain is plugged, don't put more water in the sink. That doesn't. That's not true with water because they can absorb water through their small intestine. But certainly, if a horse is colicking, don't offer them food. Um, you know, there's only one way out of the horse's stomach. They can't burp. So uh, making sure they're medication free um, and before you're feeding them is certainly the idiom to follow. Um, and I usually tell people walk them 45 minutes, give them a half hour off. Walk them 45 minutes, give them a half hour off. That's arbitrary, but it you know, keeps you your eyes on the horse uh, and keeps them you know, from you, you're aware of their symptoms. You know, if she's pawing at five o'clock in the afternoon, don't go in and do night checks at a regular time. Uh, keep her walking until she's free of symptoms. A couple of things about tying up. Most of the tying up we see now is pretty avoidable because people are aware of the hydration components of you know, muscle cramps and things like that. But we do see tying up, true tying up in horses that are genetically prone to it, that are maybe on an, a disadvantaged feed regimen uh, we know that there's genetic uh, predispositions with certain lines of thoroughbreds and warm bloods that potentiate this problem. Um, with PSSM uh, types one and two, where horses accumulate different uh, amounts of glycogen and, and lack certain enzymes for that metabolism. Uh, well beyond the scope of tonight's conversation, but you know, if you know your horse has had, uh, you know, kind of strange muscle cramping type lamenesses and you've worked it up for certain tie-up situations, there are certainly nutritional uh, and hydration kind of proactive measures you can take so that as to avoid these first aid emergencies that we're talking about. I think banamine paste and sedatives have their place here um, because these horses will be extremely uncomfortable, um, but you have to be mindful that these things uh, have potential deleterious effects to horses that are severely dehydrated. So hydration, 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 and then medication. Um, you know, we have horses like this that refuse to go forward. Uh, you know, it could be a lot of things. It could be painful front feet. It could be, you know, sore neck, chest, pectoral muscles. Usually these tie-up situations are involving the big muscle groups, the pectorals, the neck muscles, the gluteal muscles, the hamstrings. Um, but location, 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 right? Take the time to get off your horse and move it in a safe manner and try and decide, okay, you know, oh, here's the problem uh, before the problem gets bigger. Um, we now know in some of these musculoskeletal, particularly the founder situations that 
the old timers that used to say, well, I just walked them down to the irrigation ditch and stayed their feet in the cold ice water that was snow, you know, a day ago. Um, we know that that cold water is profoundly effective at reducing some of the inflammatory cascade and providing pain relief. So, um, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily available um, immediately, but uh, could certainly provide relief. I've even seen people carry the two part ice packs um, and I've seen them be effective when held against the eye, swollen eye with a towel between the ice pack. Um, icing is pretty, pretty effective. Um, compression, again, you and I, you know, rice principle, we rest it, uh, ice it, compress it and elevate it. You know, all these things occur on the lower limbs of horses, they can't elevate it. So, and their heart is above their feet. So knowing how to put a appropriate compression wrap on a distal limb that's swollen for support, as well as um, trying to work against, uh, you know, swelling from accumulating um, is twofold effective. So knowing, knowing how to do that is important. Um, again, I think, you know, you look at the two hawks, you know, this horse, you know, got in a bog and, uh, you know, when their legs are down deep in the mud, you know, they struggle to get out any way they can. And that's when strains happen, right? This hawk on our right, as compared to that on the left, that long plantar ligament on the outside of the hawk was uh, sprained. You know, the hawk, remember, has the same bones as you and my ankle. So think of how easy it is to sprain our ankle. Uh, horses do the same thing. Sometimes just having a, a non-gloved hand on your horse's leg, once it's cleaned off to kind of try and identify heat and swelling, can help you uh, target that initial therapy and get a better outcome in your horse. Um, again, a comment about, you know, compression wrapping and, you know, just putting the wrap on with a compression wrap without sufficient padding uh, in these instances can actually do more harm than good. So um, this is, I have seen some good videos on leg compression wraps on YouTube, but I've seen some bad ones. So working with your veterinarian ahead of time, I think is a, is a good idiom here. Lacerations, I mean, they come in all forms, shapes, and sizes. Um, they come, you know, tied to the trailer. Here up in the upper right is one that, you know, the horse, you know, tied to the trailer, you know, what they do when they're left alone. I mean, I, I, I don't think that book is yet finished. They, they'll always find ways. And, you know, here's a upper left, a horse that, you know, in the trailer, getting out of the, getting out of the trailer, it's to tie or not to tie. You know, the horse wants out and it's not untied yet. It's not on a breakaway. So it puts its head up through the top of the trailer. And then, you know, here on the bottom is a horse that, you know, decides getting out of the trailer, you know, to put its back legs underneath the trailer when it gets out of the trailer. Um, so, you know, pressure wraps, you know, get it covered, keep it clean, irrigate it until a veterinarian can get there. Um, having those materials in the first aid kit, um, well, it certainly helped this lower right horse. This horse did quite well, actually. It's sort of the upper left. Um, you know, again, another horse on the left, uh, when you're loading a horse and they don't want to go in the trailer, you know, everybody, they get three steps in and the back legs are still out. That's not the time to pull on the horse. You know, uh, the, those back legs slide right underneath the trailer and uh, degloving injuries is when they, that's when they occur. Um, same token, you know, shying at obstacles on down timber uh, on trails, you know, especially at this time of the year or after a summer storm, windstorm goes through, the trail didn't have any downfall last week, but this week it does. Um, I would take the time to dismount and really navigate safely around things if at all possible, because these things happen. Are, uh, these, did I see? Um, are these both uh, the the most right and the middle one there from the down timber? Yep, yep. This one was a blue spruce, dead blue spruce tree across the fe a trail that you wouldn't have thought a horse couldn't step over. But when the horse steps over and then decides it wants to go backwards and cowers down to go backwards, you know, those sticks, they, you know, they don't break easily. And then this is one here that, you know, occurs over, you know, this axillary reason tends to catch things, the, uh, the armpit area, if you will, on the horse. Um, they heal up great, these, the middle and the right, but the, the right one, 
you know, I've even go so far as to make sure some of these horses that chronically don't like to load to wrap their legs in the sheepskin nylon wraps because, you know, it, you know, I, I, last summer I actually taught quite a few clients locally here with the local fires. Having a horse that doesn't load easily in a trailer is really something you should spend just as much energy training as, as you do, you know, how it's behaved under saddle because um, these things occur in an instant and then you have a real, a real bandaging nightmare. Um, you know, you're not going to suture the bottom wound. It's again, a barbed wire wound. Um, and then the one on the left on the upper side here is a horse that, you know, is out with the, out with a couple horses, um, when they got to their destination and the horse got kicking butt to butt and there isn't much bone, much tissue over that hock. And that was a fractured, fractured leg. So, I mean, things happen, right? And uh, just be cognizant, Google a, an anatomy diagram and know where the joints and know where the tendon sheets are because these wounds, if they communicate with a joint, if they're in the proximity of a joint, they're automatically an antibiotic emergency. Um, uh, those types of wounds do not heal without veterinary care, uh, without complications, life-threatening complications. Heel bulb injuries, I, I mean, I think these are the common, you know, um, this one is one that got caught in a uh, old grate in the ground. Um, you know, one of those things that the um, mountain bikers ride over in the gates, uh, you know, and just walk your horse around, find the other way, open the gate, go around, don't try and go over those. Um, and then the, the itty bitty little things here are just a nuisance, but if you keep it covered, it'll heal. And then uh, another, I must have put this one. This is a, a horse that got out of the trailer um, on top of, tried to get out of the trailer and uh, down at Rifle Fairgrounds on its way up to Meeker and got its leg over the partition in the trailer. Um, so, you know, uh, they make really good sedatives now for horses to help embolden their ability to trailer uh, without stress. Um, just a comment. I don't know why that's coming up double. That's odd. But uh, look at the picture on the right, the anatomy of the foot. This is probably the most picture. If you're going to take home one picture of like what to be aware of when your horse is punctured, there are three joints uh, here in the bottom of the leg that, you know, complicate wounds in this area. There's the coffin joint, pasture joint, and then there's the navicular bursa. Up off the screen here would be the fetlock joint. You can imagine a nail, and horses do this all the time, a nail anywhere in the proximity of these things, as compact as the anatomy is in the foot, can really warrant uh, aggressive veterinary intervention. So, I will tell people oftentimes, if there's a nail in the foot, I would rather come see the horse. You keep the nail where it is, if at all possible, because the location of the nail uh, holds a lot of information as to what is involved in the wound. Uh, this horse on the left here, if you can believe it, is one that um, kicked, kicked a fence post and wound up putting a, a nail off the fence post in its hock. Uh, and several days later, it was infected. They pulled the nail out. And, you know, and the hawk, like I said, is your ankle. There was lots of joints there. There's four joints there. So um, be mindful a little bit as much as you can about anatomy and, um, and those caveats regarding foot injuries. A, another comment about esophageal choke. It seems to happen with a fairly good regularity every summer I hear of it happening. Um, you know, the horse maybe hasn't had good dental care or maybe it doesn't have good teeth or maybe it's older and has older teeth and they're out in meadow grass, you know, and the grass is this tall and the horses are just, you know, inhaling this meadow grass because they've walked to get there all day. You know, if they don't chew that properly, they will get esophageal choke. Now that's to be different or compared to tracheal obstruction, which you and I would get and we couldn't breathe. Horses actually get esophageal choke where they can't swallow and it causes them a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety and 
they eventually will aspirate food material from their esophagus into their trachea. But knowing the signs of this, you know, withholding additional food and getting veterinary intervention, uh, keeping their head down as low as possible until the choke resolves is very important. And I have a picture here and the picture covers it all. You know, this is a picture here of a snotty nose, you know, a horse with respiratory disease. But imagine this, this discharge looking like, you know, chewed up green grass. Um, that's how to differentiate it. Usually when it's a respiratory disease, it's coming out of both nostrils. Um, but the same goes with it's choked. Uh, that'll look just like, you know, the mash that you gave them or the grass that they ate. It's just coming out of their nose because the horse produces so much saliva that it will just, it won't be able to be swallowed. So it just comes back up and out their nose. So be mindful of that. Um, this is a common one because, uh, you know, flies up in the mountains. Depend if you're up at Thomas Lakes last weekend, there was no mosquitoes yet. That's just a little uh, research for everyone locally. Um, but they'll be there within a couple of weeks. And we'll see this. We'll see all sorts of urticaria, skin diseases, hives. Um, classically, you know, it's an inhaled allergen or biting insects. Horses really don't get food allergies, but these things can be quite irritating to horses. I mean, I've seen them have hives on top of hives underneath saddle pads and horses do not want to have a saddle pad on when they have these things. So um, if your horse is prone to allergies, I usually tell people to carry a little Zyrtec in their first aid kit because uh, it works pretty well. Um, and if you know your horse is sensitive to insects, carry some uh, insect wipes or utilize some of the topical oils that you can apply every 10 or 14 days uh, pr proactively. Um, so again, here are just a couple pictures because pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, I see people give IM shots up here, you know, way up on the neck, up underneath the, underneath the mane and, uh, you know, empowerment through knowledge you know it's this triangle is a big muscle and so is this one this one's at the business end um, so unless you're adept at giving shots probably not where i'm going to suggest you give a shot um, but this is a great one um, if your veterinarian has given you uh, judicious um, information knowledge and dispensed uh, the appropriate uh, sedatives to give um, I put this here for information purposes only because I don't want anyone to get kicked. Um, and, and, and a couple comments that, you know, tranquilizers cause horses to be hypotensive. So if your horse is dehydrated, they can complicate some of your horse's issues. They have to be done with um, accurate knowledge of your horse's health. And pain meds, uh, as in a foundered horse, can actually make them do more damage to their feet because they're walking around, you know, somewhat on cloud nine. They're not respecting their orthopedic injury and compromising their foot pathology even further. So um, be cognizant of those things. Um, do no harm is the idiom that veterinarians take. So that's kind of the way I avoid it. Um, you know, like I referenced earlier, um, you know, the, the seven P's of uh, Prior proper planning prevents poor performance. Proactive medicine, right? I mean, vaccinate the horse for tetanus, keep the horse, you know, in somebody's care so that some of these things, tying up, you know, recurrent colics, parasitism that causes colics, you know, tie your horse's general health annual exam, whenever that may be in the spring, in the fall, in the summer, into an understanding of how to avoid emergencies as you know we present them here um, so you could have a more enjoyable time out on the week uh, out on the, the warrior weekend that we all now ascribe to with COVID uh, passing. Um, just like you and I keep yourself cool and hydrated. Um, I see the dogs jogging in the dog days of summer you know with people and that's not good for them and think of your horse too. make sure that you keep them hydrated. You'll prevent a lot of colics and tie-up situations if you do so. Um, horses do get heat stress and, and certainly just a, a comment about internal parasitism. Um, colics uh, can be avoided uh, in many instances. Just uh, more, you know, 
prior proper planning comments. Uh, you won't recognize your horse as being abnormal unless you spend some time with it and understand what is normal. Um, and sometimes changes are subtle. You know, the horse is shying, the horse is backing. Uh, there's a little extra swelling in that leg. Oh, wait a minute, look further. Um, there's, there's a laceration there. Or wait a minute, the eye is a little uh, squinty, if you will. Um, take the time to uh, identify um, what your horse is normally so you can better prepare for the emergencies. So by request, I put in a few comments here on vaccinations as we move away from the first aid comments, uh, unless there's any questions. Um, Everybody's muted, but I, I certainly invite you all to chime in if there's an instance that you wish to discuss. Um, I would, I would, I guess I would be sort of curious. Um, with many of these things, they seem to be common sense, but do you find <laughs> that uh, horse owners are uh, they they damage their their horse's health? considerably? I mean, you know, I think, you know, the average horse owner now is 10 years older than they were 10 years ago. We don't see very many young people getting into horses, you know, and as always, knowledge is a continuum, right? I mean, um, I don't see very many people have that circumstance. Certainly, I don't see anybody having that happen willfully, but we do things like, oh, I pulled the nail out. It was in there yesterday and I didn't want to come in until Monday. Okay, that was an emergency. I would rather see you on Memorial Day weekend. Um, the bandage bow, I think we see that with almost some regularity every summer. We see two, maybe three of those. Um, we also see, um, we didn't talk much about it tonight. We talked about it at our last presentation. Um, we see the subtle signs of early laminitis be kind of overlooked. You know, the horse came back from a three day weekend ride. We gave it some extra grain. Um, you know, we see subtle things be problematic and it's always the uh, hindsight is 2020. You know, the horse, I got after him to get in the trailer because I was just tired of him not getting in the trailer. Well, you know, I, I think horse owners are generally one of the more educated uh, demographics of animal lovers because they've invested so much in their animal, whether it's training, shoeing, veterinary care, board, you know. So I feel blessed to 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 work with everybody because I think they they really take ownership of their horse's care. Um, that's my perspective, okay. but I'm sure there are lots of others. Well, um, but it's, it's it's truly the the emergency. Um, yeah the re the recognition of the emergencies that is the biggest failing perhaps huh and, and what do they say uh you know uh intellectual um prowess is diluted by uh, uh emotional intelligence when an emergency happens and your beloved horse is in a crisis you know sometimes it's harder to make accurate decisions then um, but with repetition comes learning, right? I mean, I, that's why I think you could give this conversation to a different group of people every 10 days. And, you know, if one person gleans one additional thing, I think there's value in it. Okay. Um, uh, you know, so uh, happy to, like I say, we'll put this as a PDF to you and you can propagate it to the masses with hopes it helps somebody out there. Right. Chuck, I had a um, question. Sure. Yeah. Do you remember a couple of years ago, um, Apple um, cut open his back right leg just by his hock and I called you and I showed you a picture of it, but it was foaming. And yep. you were like, that was like, I need to come over right away. If you can maybe speak to that. I think that goes to the comments I was making regarding having some understanding of anatomy. As I recall, that was over a potential bursa in his leg. And yeah. if you can imagine, you know, bursas and joints, right? They're filled with fluid that are meant to lubricate areas that hinge or move. And um, when I see kind of like a clear dilute honey-like substance coming out of a wound that's near a joint, that's like, okay, we in the veterinary world have this, you know, you have clean wounds you have contaminated wounds, and then you have infected wounds. 
So you might have a contaminated wound that I can fix early and easily versus you allow that contamination to persist for a few days. Then you have an infected wound that needs round the clock antibiotics and so forth. So I think that's, you know, the, I would just get everybody to, you know, there's AEP, the horse magazine. We have one on our calendars, you know, grab a picture of a horse and, and look at the joints and, and, and also, too, we, uh, two summers ago, we got a phone call from somebody about three miles out on Capitol. Uh, they had enough cell phone range and, you know, they were able to describe where the wound was. You know, when somebody says, oh, the wound's on the Gaskin, I'm like, oh, great. There's no joints there, you know, you know, versus like it's on the leg, on the knee and it comes in and it's on the back leg, not the front leg where the knee, you know, it's so, um, you know, it just... Uh, that apples, I do remember, Chantel, I appreciate you thinking I might remember at my age, um, <laughs> but the uh, apples wound there was next to, next to a joint bursa. So we had to kind of not be lackadaisical about how we managed it. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, we'll give uh, a little time to vaccines. Um, you know, I think the way I put these together is kind of like you could put this to any group um, because there are certain things uh, with vaccination that are considered core or in other words, every horse on the planet needs these vaccines and there are other vaccines that are risk based. Um, if your horse is um, in Kentucky and you don't vaccinate it for botulism, um, where we see that occur commonly with the weather and how hay is put up, um, you know, but you don't need that in Western Colorado. So there are certain things that every horse needs and I put them there, uh, tetanus, you know, clostridial uh, organisms exist in and outside every horse in every horse environment. And horses do the darndest things when we're not looking or when we're sleeping. So. Prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, horses used to die of tetanus and now they don't because the vaccines are extremely effective. Um, West Nile, we had a couple cases of West Nile down in Rifle uh, two summers ago. Um, it is considered endemic in all aspects of the Culicoides tarsalis mosquito, which we have at Thomas Lakes and in Redstone and Marble. And in certain of those, you know, you'd think rifle is not a, you know, not the capital of the mosquito capital of the world, but there are those dry, you know, creek beds that have those mosquito populations that we had two cases. So uh, worth bearing note, vaccines 97% effective. Sleeping sickness, we haven't had a case in Western Colorado for some time. Um, if your horse travels to New York though, or Michigan, uh, boy, you'd better. Uh, they have had Eastern uh, equine encephalitis almost annually in the upper New York, um, Michigan area. Um, and the vaccine is, you know, virtually 100% effective. So I see no reason why not to do that. Rabies is another obvious. Um, you know, we get exposed here in Western Colorado to rabies via the terrestrial insect eating bats. Um, on the front range of Colorado, we have skunks uh, and raccoons that carry their uh, portion of rabies. But, you know, we had a horse in Colorado here that had rabies and it was exposed um, to the air, uh, rabies in Arizona that came here. Um, so again, it's core. Um, there's a human health risk. Um, five years ago when they had the rabies uh, pretty hot and heavy on the front range, uh, the Colorado Board of Health came out and said, you were the most likely to be exposed to rabies if you were a horse owner, um, because such a high percentage of the horse population was naive with respect to rabies vaccine. And, you know, yours truly, um, you know, January 19th, I uh, got exposed to the rabbit horse on Cottonwood Pass, and, you know, and there was three feet of snow on the ground. So it's easy to overlook it, uh, and it's easy to prevent it. Um, Risk-based vaccines, you know, if you've got a horse uh, on the top of a salt mountain that lives by itself, you know, annually vaccinating it once for rhino and flu, probably effective. And you could argue maybe that's not necessary because there's no exposure. But if you're like many people, 
um, like the horse I alluded to earlier that was going to take a ride out on the trail with a respiratory nasal discharge and a high fever, you know, having your horse vaccinated, you might think your horse lives by itself, but you're going to be out, you know, drinking from a water trough in Utah down on the Onion Creek campground. Um, you got to think of it a little bit more globally as to whether or not your horse has any potential for exposure. Strangles, typically a young horse disease, uh, bacterial disease. Um, so we don't typically vaccinate horses that are old, older than eight. We usually start vaccinating when they're, when they're foals because the vaccine is quite effective at reducing uh, the morbidity of the disease. Um, Chuck, is that strangles or stangles? Well, you know, my spell check, um, my spell check is just, you know, I'm insomnic. So if I'm typing at midnight, it's dangerous. Okay. So I think that so, strangles. So in, um, in Michigan, um, there were probably 23 horses put down uh, that died of strangles. Yep. And I would say maybe a fifth of them had been vaccinated. Right. So the strangles vaccine is a modified live vaccine. It actually confers immunity by exposing the animal to a less virulent form of the disease. Okay. Um, we don't see disease occur from the vaccination. We may see a little gray nasal discharge for a day or two. Interestingly, um, it, it, the study that was done on Strangles vaccine actually showed that horses, you know, required less hospitalization, and less care by about 40 to 50 percent. So, you know, all these diseases, when we talk about tetanus, sleeping sickness, West Nile, those, those vaccines are in the 97, 99 percentile for being protective. Strangles vaccine is much further down on the list, 60 percent. But when you consider the worldwide financial implications of strangles, if you've got a young horse at risk, we use it because you know a 40% or 60% reduction in morbidity and mortality is actually quite measurable. Okay. Um, interestingly, a comment on the strangles thing too, about five years ago, I don't know if you remember here in Colorado, in Denver and in Grand Junction, they had this really virulent form of strangles uh, that was essentially closed the equine show world in Colorado for like the better part of a summer because they had these horses that were like the ones in Michigan that were dying. So we vaccinated a heck of a lot of horses that summer because they were going to be potentially exposed to this more virulent form. So strangles is kind of one of those bacterial diseases that unfortunately like other bacterial diseases may become even more risky because of the inadvertent or unjudicious use of antibiotics. Okay. So to be continued, I think, on that Thank you. Uh, front. Um, you know, vaccines aren't a guarantee. If it's 99%, it's 99%. It doesn't mean that your horse uh, can't get it, um, but very unlikely. Uh, rhino, interestingly, rhino and flu, um, fall into this category of risk-based, but they also fall into this category of kind of short-term immunity. Um, you know, you can vaccinate a dog for distemper or parvo, and that immunity lasts, we know, for three years. We think, and the studies haven't been done, done yet, but we think some of these core vaccines, when the studies are probably done, those vaccines may confer immunity that lasts longer than a year but rhino and flu, we know those vaccines do not confer immunity that lasts a long time, particularly rhino, uh, herpes virus. And you see this one, you know, in Ohio and Kentucky and in Florida and California, all over the world actually, because um, these neurologic, neurotropic forms of the virus have emerged and are resistant to vaccination and they have a much higher morbidity and mortality rate. So, you know, having an understanding a little bit of biosecurity as well as these risk-based vaccination strategies, I think is a good thing for your horse. Um, just like you and I too, these vaccines, like I mentioned, are alluded to with certain diseases lasting longer, they need to be boosted. One shot doesn't confer, it's not like you and I where we get a, 
uh, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus vaccine, where we get 10 years of protection. Those circumstances don't exist with horses. So typically an annual wellness vaccine appointment is, is what is good practice in the horse world. Um, you know, and, and think of uh, the population out there of people and, uh, and analogize it to uh, horses. You got young horses, adult horses, and geriatric horses. Those geriatric horses um, don't have the bolster, bolstered immunity of being young and, and they have other diseases like Cushing's disease and things that even further complicate the longevity of their immunity from vaccination. So, you know, being kind of strategic in your veterinarian, with your veterinarian and their approach to vaccination, I think is a good idea because um, the two, three, four, eight year old horse really doesn't have a, uh, it doesn't have a, a um, you know, identical vaccination strategy program to say the horse that's got Cushing's disease, that's 25. Um, so having some herd health global perspective is a good idea in this instance. Um, you know, I, I always, you know, think of, well, I mean, the, the analogy now would obviously be the COVID vaccine, right? You turn on the news and people are saying, you know, somebody has a sore arm or flu-like symptoms or things like this. I mean, if you think about what vaccines are supposed to do, whether they're a killed virus or a modified live, they are given to an animal to incite an immune response. You know, hey, wake up. I want you to make antibodies to this disease so you don't get sicker in the future. So while designing of the vaccines we use now is superior to those used before, it isn't unheard of to hear of one horse in 20 or one horse in 30 that may have a little off, little off, little fever, you know, barely over the normal range the next day. Um, you know, that is not an abnormal response that falls within the bell curve of normal responses to vaccines. Um, certainly 25 years ago, I remember horses getting vaccinated and they'd have 105 temp, you know, the odd rhino flu vaccine. And those instances just don't occur anymore. We don't see that. Um, and just like, uh, you know, if we've got kids and, you know, you bring them to the pediatrician, that initial series of vaccination is more than an annual shot. It's a, it's a series uh, designed to incite a long lasting immune response. So be cognizant that the age of your horse will uh, affect the vaccine frequency. You know, remember you, 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 you walk away from the needle, your horse walks away from the needle, it's vaccinated, your horse needs to go to Hawaii, uh, needs to go overseas, Vaccine is not conferred instantaneously from a vaccine. Um, there's a period after which uh, generally two weeks is considered to be where those antibodies uh, that are stimulated um, take to provide that protection. So just remember that um, I'm going to a show uh, over in Parker. Um, you know, I'm going Friday, so I'm getting the vaccine on Wednesday. No, back up two weeks and booster your horse two weeks earlier. You'll, it'll certainly be healthier as a result. Um, uh, just more comments on boosters. You know, again, just, you know, as it goes to rhino flu, if uh, like a horse I'm thinking that shows saddlebred, that shows saddle seat, you know, he travels all over the country over the next nine months, he's gonna get a rhino flu shot every three months as compared to potentially every once a year or every, or every six months because that immunity needs to be superior at all times. And uh, we don't want to potentiate those viral infections that spread so easily at horse shows. Again, just, you know, when you look at a population, these are the metrics by which we, you know, put through the, the equation to decide what your horse's vaccine frequency should be. Just one slide, I think, on every vaccine, just to, here's the nail I think it was Brenda or maybe Charlie, Charlie that asked, or no, it was uh, you, Karen, that asked about the puncture. Here's the nail in the foot. I mean, if don't pull that nail out, let me come to the horse to see where that nail is because we can learn so much from where it is and the depth of penetration um, and really get that horse off on the, the right foot. Um, I haven't seen a case of tetanus since I was an intern this is a horse that had tetanus, locked jaw, 
Uh, they've become very excited to sound. You clap and their third eyelids move. Um, again, unheard of now with the, um, the vaccines as they are designed. Sleeping sickness. Uh, this is a horse in Minnesota uh, that I saw as an intern. Um, they had, uh, you know, mosquitoes as big as robins. And, you know, it's kind of unheard of to hear horses that are unvaccinated for this, but they occur, um, you know, not getting going down the rabbit hole, the vaccine thing, but um, these diseases are preventable. Um, uh, West Nile viruses, I, I mentioned, you know, down in Rifle a couple of years ago, two cases. Um, and going back even further, maybe 10 years, right down the street, you know, they had uh, um, residents in the senior citizens home that were exposed to West Nile because we had West Nile mosquitoes that were trapped down toward Redstone, uh, you know, in a relatively, you know, mosquito free zone, if you will. So um, just because you don't think the mosquitoes are as big as robins in your, in your neck of the woods, um, still West Nile considered a core vaccine uh, endemic in uh, the, uh, in the United States. Um, and West Nile is one of those really challenging neurologic diseases. Is my horse lame? It can be, this horse could be laying down, in which case, okay, it's neurologic. Or this horse could look lame, but really be neurologic. Um, and it can, it's like EPM. And, uh, you know, I found out uh, this weekend seeing a dead possum that we even have EPM on the Missouri Heights, or possums at least. Uh, we had two cases of EPM in Colorado uh, last year uh, in the valley here. So um, there's no vaccine for that anymore, but getting off topic. Uh, West Nile, again, 98%, according to, I believe, the last study that was done on the vaccine's efficacy. So easily preventable. Uh, going into the risk-based ones, you know, snotty nose, upper respiratory tract infection, dry, hacky, productive cough with a fever over 101.5 um, can certainly progress to a bacterial pneumonia. Um, but, you know, imagine having the flu. Difficult to discern um, the, the symptoms between influenza or flu and rhinopneumonitis or herpes. Um, a little bit of age demographics. The rhino tends to affect the younger horses. The flu tends to affect the older horses, but very similar symptomatology. A couple comments on rhino and herpes. I mentioned earlier uh, about the uh, different forms of herpes. There are neurotropic forms. There are different forms of the virus that affect both the respiratory and reproductive systems of horses. They can affect stallions. They can affect mares. They can cause mares to abort. Um, they can cause all sorts of mayhem in different body systems. So um, while the vaccine is not effective uh, against the neurotropic form, is quite effective if given at the right frequency for avoiding the abortive and respiratory form. And just like you, me, and the dogs at the dog park, all these respiratory things are spread via aerosol droplets. Um, it's, uh, it's not like they're gonna sit on airplanes and have uh, respiratory droplets to the person sitting in the row in front of them. But when they're over at the Denver Stock Show and they're at the show there for a week and they're stressed and they're immune compromised as a result of that stress, uh, that isn't the time to have their immunity be um, to wane because of a lack of vaccination. <clears throat> uh, and back to, yeah. Um, would you say that um, most vets agree that when you have a, um, a horse on the real show circuit, when you're going, you know, every couple of weeks out of every every month that it's this every three month booster? I think so. You know, that's, that is, we know that rhino particularly wanes and rhino is a real challenge to keep out of commingled stressed horses, right? I mean, it's herpes virus, right? Herpes viruses in humans cause cold sores. So there, when you gather a population of horses, what, her, what herpes viruses do is they go latent in the host. You have horses that don't show clinical signs that carry the virus after they've been sick. And those horses serve as a reservoir for infecting, you know, 
you know, you got, you know, you're showing uh, 49th in the show, uh, or you're, like I said, this, this just this afternoon, uh, taking this horse up the trail with a, a low grade fever and a snotty nose. Uh, I mean, you're coming back thinking everything's hunky dory and you were exposed unknowingly. And then Wednesday next, you called me because your horse has got a snotty nose and a cough and, you, you know, challenging. Uh, but I do think that that idiom or that mainstay of therapy every three months for that show horse is, is okay. commonly held. Thank you. <clears throat> One last word about stangles, or in I spelt it incorrectly here as strangles. Um, here's the here's the colt right with the pus draining out of its uh, lymph nodes underneath of it, of its jaw. You know that stuff that leaks all over the floor, leaks all over your trailer, all over the water trough will be there till the dawn of time, unless it's at, you know, and you just, I, I think of an instance, I can't incriminate it, but a lady that went to a horse hotel uh, a couple summers ago and came home, you know, complete, you know, lives in a vacuum and came home and then this nine-year-old horse came down with strangles, never had it as a cold, you know, and I just think water and moist environments tend to keep these things uh, alive in the soil and then you know the naive horse population right we were a naive world with respect to covid you know they we see that's when we're living that's when we see illness so um what your horse's risk-based assessment is, is two years ago may change if you decide to trailer or transportate you know transport your horse and do different things with it you know now that we're all traveling free and about so so um, when you do have a horse with the strangles, you uh, what, get rid of everything in the stall and- Yep, donate it. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. The study was actually done, there hasn't been one done recently, but I believe the study was done way back when. It was done in New Jersey or one of them was, and it, it looked at this population of saddlebreds and, uh, and standard breds, these horses, shed strangles bacteria out of their nasal secretions uh, for weeks to months after their abscesses healed on their throat. And I, I think you asked about what other veterinarians do. I think it's pretty common nowadays when you see a case of strangles that it's not just, all right, well, when those scabs heal, just turn them back out in the herd. Um, nowadays, it's I think customary to use PCR testing with a nasal swab don't bother testing them for a couple of weeks after their scabs have healed. But I usually say quarantine them for two weeks after it's all healed and then start doing a nasal swab, uh, just like, you know, COVID test. And we can detect the organism there. And, you know, some horses shed the bacteria for three weeks and there were horses in the study that shed it for months. Wow. And there, that's like the rhino horse, right? The horse got sick, got over it, but it still sheds it in its nasal secretions and it, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, so, you know, and actually that strangles horse occurred, they had 57 other horses. Uh, if we put it out with all the other horses, we'd have strangles there till forever. Um, but we tested it and we knew it was negative before we put it back in the herd. So. Um, but, but then the, the dirt in the stall as well what put it well, in a pickup and take it take it to the big dump yeah we try to you know once we get a, an infectious disease like that we try and you know kind of work with where the horse is to kind of you know all right where can we design best the place for the best biosecurity you know where are we going to have to clean up the least right um, Got it. some some sort of you know surface that's able to be mucked out and gotten rid of i think I think commonly if the if the soil dries um, while the bacteria is resistant to drying, I think more commonly the higher longevity or the, the longer infection risk is carried by those like water buckets and water troughs and you know the muddy areas around those areas. Um, so you know, no two cases are the same. Thank you. Happy trails to everybody out there. Uh, and your horses. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And 
otherwise turn you loose for dinner. Brenda, do you have some questions? No, thank you very much. Now, You're welcome. Brenda, we're going to put this up on uh, the Horse Council website over here. I, I put the link. And then we're going to get a YouTube and we're going to get the actual videos as well. So that'll be good. How about you, Lena? Everything all right? Yeah, no, I'm good. Uh, thanks a lot, Chuck, for taking time out of your day to do this for us. Sure. It's very informative. I'm probably one of those that picks up one or two things from it that can remember something without Repet writing it down and taking it with me, but uh, very helpful. Yep. Thank you. Repetition is the key to learning. So, you know, two things taken 50 times is you're all set for the next trail ride. All right. <laughs> well, and how about I you? will turn how it over to- How about you, Charlie? Let's just finish with you. Oh, I'm muting. Um, no questions, Chuck. Fantastic as always, so informative. And um, you've definitely helped me out um, many times. Um, and, you know, part of that was calling you and saying, what do you think? um before yeah. you know ra racing in or jumping to conclusions but yeah. um yeah yeah so um thank you so much for your time um it's just super helpful to all of My us pleasure yeah all right thank all right. you everybody well, thank you yeah we'll be in touch night all right bye, bye. happy trails happy trails mm -hmm.